Rosamund. Rosamund turned. The mute appeal in the girl's unhappy face touched her. She linked her arm through Linda's and together they walked away from the hotel, taking the path that led to the extreme end of the island. Rosamund said gently. Try not to mind so much, Linda. I know it's all very terrible and a shock and all that, but it's no use brooding over these things. And it can be only the horror of it that is worrying you. You weren't in the least fond of Arlena, you know. She felt the tremor that ran through the girl's body as Linda answered. No, I wasn't fond of her. Rosamund went on. Sorrow for a person is different, one can't put that behind one. But one can get over shock and horror by just not letting your mind dwell on it all the time. Linda said sharply. You don't understand. I think I do, my dear. Linda shook her head. No, you don't. You don't understand in the least, and Christine doesn't understand either. Both of you have been nice to me, but you can't understand what I'm feeling. You just think it's morbid that I'm dwelling on it all when I needn't. She paused. But it isn't that at all. If you knew what I know. Rosamund stopped dead. Her body did not tremble, on the contrary it stiffened. She stood for a minute or two, then she disengaged her arm from Linda's. She said. What is it that you know, Linda? The girl gazed at her. Then she shook her head. She muttered. Nothing. Rosamund caught her by the arm. The grip hurt and Linda winced slightly. Rosamund said. Be careful, Linda. Be damned careful. Linda had gone dead white. She said. I am very careful, all the time. Rosamund said urgently. Listen, Linda, what I said a minute or two ago applies just the same, only a hundred times more so. Put the whole business out of your mind. Never think about it. Forget, forget. You can if you try. Arlena is dead and nothing can bring her back to life. Forget everything and live in the future. And above all, hold your tongue. Linda shrank a little. She said. You, you seem to know all about it. Rosamund said energetically. I don't know anything. In my opinion a wandering maniac got onto the island and killed Arlena. That's much the most probable solution. I'm fairly sure that the police will have to accept that in the end. That's what must have happened. That's what did happen. Linda said. If father. Rosamund interrupted her. Don't talk about it. Linda said. I've got to say one thing. My mother. Well, what about her? She, she was tried for murder, wasn't she? Yes. Linda said slowly. And then father married her. That looks, doesn't it, as though father didn't really think murder was very wrong, not always, that is. Rosamund said sharply. Don't say things like that, even to me. The police haven't got anything against your father. He's got an alibi, an alibi that they can't break. He's perfectly safe. Linda whispered. Did they think at first that father? Rosamund cried. I don't know what they thought. But they know now that he couldn't have done it. Do you understand? He couldn't have done it. She spoke with authority, her eyes commanded Linda's acquiescence. The girl uttered a long fluttering sigh. Rosamund said. You'll be able to leave here soon. You'll forget everything, everything. Linda said with sudden unexpected violence. I shall never forget. She turned abruptly and ran back to the hotel. Rosamund stared after her. There is something I want to know, madam. Christine Redfern glanced up at Poirot in a slightly abstracted manner. She said. Yes? Hercule Poirot took very little notice of her abstraction. He had noted the way her eyes followed her husband's figure where he was pacing up and down on the terrace outside the bar, but for the moment he had no interest in purely conjugal problems. 
he wanted information. He said, Yes, madam. It was a phrase, a chance phrase of yours the other day which roused my attention. Christine, her eyes still on Patrick, said. Yes? What did I say? It was an answer to a question from the chief constable. You described how you went into Miss Linda Marshall's room on the morning of the crime and how you found her absent from it and how she returned there, and it was then that the chief constable asked you where she had been. Christine said rather impatiently. And I said she had been bathing? Is that it? Ah, but you did not say quite that. You did not say she had been bathing. Your words were, she said she had been bathing. Christine said. It's the same thing, surely. No, it is not the same. The form of your answer suggests a certain attitude of mind on your part. Linda Marshall came into the room, she was wearing a bathing wrap and yet, for some reason, you did not at once assume she had been bathing. That is shown by your words, she said she had been bathing. What was there about her appearance, was it her manner, or something that she was wearing or something she said, that led you to feel surprised when she said she had been bathing? Christine's attention left Patrick and focused itself entirely on Poirot. She was interested. She said. That's clever of you. It's quite true, now I remember. I was, just faintly, surprised when Linda said she had been bathing. But why, madam, why? Yes, why? That's just what I'm trying to remember. Oh yes, I think it was the parcel in her hand. She had a parcel? Yes. You do not know what was in it? Oh yes, I do. The string broke. It was loosely done up in the way they do in the village. It was candles, they were scattered on the floor. I helped her to pick them up. Ah, said Poirot. Candles. Christine stared at him. She said. You seem excited, M. Poirot. Poirot asked. Did Linda say why she had bought candles? Christine reflected. No, I don't think she did. I suppose it was to read by at night, perhaps the electric light wasn't good. On the contrary, madam, there was a bedside electric lamp in perfect order. Christine said. Then I don't know what she wanted them for. Poro said. What? T was her manner, when the string broke and the candles fell out of the parcel? Christine said slowly. She was upset, embarrassed. Poro nodded his head. Then he asked. Did you notice a calendar in her room? A calendar? What kind of a calendar? Poro said. Possibly a green calendar, with tear-off leaves. Christine screwed up her eyes in an effort of memory. A green calendar, rather a bright green. Yes, I have seen a calendar like that, but I can't remember where. It may have been in Linda's room, but I can't be sure. But you have definitely seen such a thing. Yes. Again Poro nodded. Christine said rather sharply. What are you hinting at, M. Poro? What is the meaning of all this? For answer Poro produced a small volume bound in faded brown calf. He said. Have you ever seen this before? Why, I think, I'm not sure, yes, Linda was looking into it in the village lending library the other day. But she shut it up and thrust it back quickly when I came up to her. It made me wonder what it was. Silently Poro displayed the title. A history of witchcraft, sorcery, and of the compounding of untraceable poisons. Christine said. I don't understand. What does all this mean? Poro said gravely. It may mean, madam, a good deal. She looked at him inquiringly but he did not go on. Instead he asked. One more question, madam, did you take a bath that morning before you went out to play tennis? Christine stared again. A bath? No. I would have had no time and, anyway, I didn't want a bath, not before tennis. I might have had one after. 
Did you use your bathroom at all when you came in? I sponged my face and hands, that's all. You did not turn on the bath at all? No, I'm sure I didn't. Poro nodded. He said. It is of no importance. Hercule Poro stood by the table where Mrs. Gardner was wrestling with a jigsaw. She looked up and jumped. Why, M. Poro, how very quietly you came up beside me. I never heard you. Have you just come back from the inquest? You know, the very thought of that inquest makes me so nervous, I don't know what to do. That's why I'm doing this puzzle. I just felt I couldn't sit outside on the beach as usual. As Mr. Gardner knows, when my nerves are all upset, there's nothing like one of these puzzles for calming me. There now, where does this white piece fit in? It must be part of the fur rug, but I don't seem to see. Gently Poro's hand took the piece from her. He said. It fits, madam, here. It is part of the cat. It can't be. It's a black cat. A black cat, yes, but you see the tip of the black cat's tail happens to be white. Why, so it does. How clever of you. But I do think the people who make puzzles are kind of mean. They just go out of their way to deceive you. She fitted in another piece and then resumed. You know, M. Poro, I've been watching you this last day or two. I just wanted to watch you detecting if you know what I mean, not that it doesn't sound rather heartless put like that, as though it were all a game, and a poor creature killed. Oh dear, every time I think of it I get the shivers. I told Mr. Gardner this morning I'd just got to get away from here, and now the inquest's over he thinks we'll be able to leave tomorrow, and that's a blessing, I'm sure. But about detecting, I would so like to know your methods, you know. I'd feel privileged if you'd just explain it to me." Hercule Poro said. It is a little like your puzzle, madam. One assembles the pieces. It is like a mosaic, many colors and patterns, and every strange shaped little piece must be fitted into its own place. Now isn't that interesting? Why, I'm sure you explain it just too beautifully. Poro went on. And sometimes it is like that piece of your puzzle just now. One arranges very methodically the pieces of the puzzle, one sorts the colors, and then perhaps a piece of one color that should fit in with, say, the fur rug, fits in instead in a black cat's tail. Why, if that doesn't sound too fascinating? And are there a great many pieces, M. Poro? Yes, madam. Almost everyone here in this hotel has given me a piece for my puzzle. You amongst them. Me? Mrs. Gardner's tone was shrill. Yes, a remark of yours, madam, was exceedingly helpful. I might say it was illuminating. Well, if that isn't too lovely. Can't you tell me some more, M. Poro? Ah. Madam, I reserve the explanations for the last chapter. Mrs. Gardner murmured. If that isn't just too bad. Hercule Poro tapped gently on the door of Captain Marshall's room. Inside there was the sound of a typewriter. A curt come and came from the room and Poro entered. Captain Marshall's back was turned to him. He was sitting typing at the table between the windows. He did not turn his head but his eyes met Poro's in the mirror that hung on the wall directly in front of him. He said irritably. Well, M. Poro, what is it? Poro said quickly. A thousand apologies for intruding. You are busy? Marshall said shortly, I am rather. Poro said. It is one little question that I would like to ask you. Marshall said. My God, I'm sick of answering questions. I've answered the police questions. I don't feel called upon to answer yours. Poro said. Mine is a very simple one. Only this. On the morning of your wife's death, did you have a bath after you finished typing and before you went out to play tennis? A bath? No, of course I didn't. I'd had a bathe only an hour earlier. Hercule Poro said. Thank you. That is all. But look here. 
Oh, the other paused irresolutely. Poro withdrew, gently closing the door. Kenneth Marshall said. The fellow's crazy. Just outside the bar Poro encountered Mr. Gardner. He was carrying two cocktails and was clearly on his way to where Mrs. Gardner was ensconced with her jigsaw. He smiled at Poro in genial fashion. Care to join us, M. Poro? Poro shook his head. He said. What did you think of the inquest, Mr. Gardner? Mr. Gardner lowered his voice. He said. Seemed kind of indeterminate to me. Your police, I gather, have got something up their sleeves. It is possible, said Hercule Poirot. Mr. Gardner lowered his voice still further. I shall be glad to get Mrs. Gardner away. She's a very, very sensitive woman, and this affair has got on her nerves. She's very highly strong. Hercule Poirot said. Will you permit me, Mr. Gardner, to ask you one question? Why, certainly, M. Poirot. Delighted to assist in any way I can. Hercule Poirot said. You are a man of the world, a man, I think, of considerable acumen. What, frankly, was your opinion of the late Mrs. Marshall? Mr. Gardner's eyebrows rose in surprise. He glanced cautiously round and lowered his voice. Well, M. Poirot, I've heard a few things that have been kind of going. Gee around, if you get me, especially among the women. Poirot nodded. But if you ask me I'll tell you my candid opinion and that is that that woman was pretty much of a darn fool. Hercule Poirot said thoughtfully. Now that is very interesting. Rosamund Darnley said, so it's my turn, is it? Pardon? She laughed. The other day the chief constable held this inquisition. You sat by. Today, I think, you are conducting your own unofficial inquiry. I've been watching you. First Mrs. Redfern, then I caught a glimpse of you through the lounge window where Mrs. Gardner is doing her hateful jigsaw puzzle. Now it's my turn. Hercule Poirot sat down beside her. They were on Sunny Ledge. Below them the sea showed a deep glowing green. Farther out it was a pale dazzling blue. Poro said. You are very intelligent, mademoiselle. I have thought so ever since I arrived here. It would be a pleasure to discuss this business with you. Rosamund Darnley said softly. You want to know what I think about the whole thing? It would be most interesting. Rosamund said. I think it's really very simple. The clue is in the woman's past. The past? Not the present? Oh! Not necessarily the very remote past. I look at it like this. Arlena Marshall was attractive, fatally attractive, to men. It's possible, I think, that she also tired of them rather quickly. Amongst her, followers, shall we say, was one who resented that. Oh, don't misunderstand me, it won't be someone who sticks out a mile. Probably some tepid little man, vain and sensitive, the kind of man who broods. I think he followed her down here, waited his opportunity and killed her. You mean that he was an outsider, that he came from the mainland? Yes. He probably hid in that cave until he got his chance. Poro shook his head. He said. Would she go there to meet such a man as you describe? No, she would laugh and not go. Rosamund said. She mayn't have known she was going to meet him. He may have sent her a message in some other person's name. Poro murmured. That is possible. Then he said. But you forget one thing, mademoiselle. A man bent on murder could not risk coming in broad daylight across the causeway and past the hotel. Someone might have seen him. They might have, but I don't think that it's certain. I think it's quite possible that he could have come without anyone noticing him at all. It would be possible, yes, that I grant you. But the point is that he could not count on that possibility. Rosamund said. Aren't you forgetting something? The weather. The weather? Yes. 
The day of the murder was a glorious day, but the day before, remember, there was rain and thick mist. Anyone could come onto the island then without being seen. He had only to go down to the beach and spend the night in the cave. That mist, M. Poro, is important. Poro looked at her thoughtfully for a minute or two. He said. You know, there is a good deal in what you have just said. Rosamund flushed. She said. That's my theory, for what it is worth. Now tell me yours. Ah, said Hercule Poro. He stared down at the sea. Eh bien, mademoiselle. I am a very simple person. I always incline to the belief that the most likely person committed the crime. At the very beginning it seemed to me that one person was very clearly indicated. Rosamund's voice hardened a little. She said. Go on. Hercule Poirot went on. But you see, there is what you call a snag in the way. It seems that it was impossible for that person to have committed the crime. He heard the quick expulsion of her breath. She said rather breathlessly. Well? Hercule Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Well, what do we do about it? That is my problem. He paused and then went on. May I ask you a question? Certainly. She faced him, alert and vigilant. But the question that came was an unexpected one. When you came in to change for tennis that morning, did you have a bath? Rosamund stared at him. A bath? What do you mean? That is what I mean. A bath. The receptacle of porcelain, one turns the taps and fills it, one gets in, one gets out and gush, 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 the water goes down the waste pipe. M. Poro, are you quite mad? No, I am extremely sane. Well, anyway, I didn't take a bath. Ha, said Poro. So nobody took a bath. That is extremely interesting. But why should anyone take a bath? Hercule Poirot said, Why, indeed? Rosamund said with some exasperation. I suppose this is the Sherlock Holmes touch. Hercule Poirot smiled. Then he sniffed the air delicately. Will you permit me to be impertinent, mademoiselle? I'm sure you couldn't be impertinent, M. Poirot. That is very kind of you. Then may I venture to say that the scent you use is delicious, it has a nuance, a delicate elusive charm. He waved his hands, and then added in a practical voice, Gabriel, number 8, I think? How clever you are. Yes, I always use it. So did the late Mrs. Marshall. It is chic, eh? And very expensive? Rosamund shrugged her shoulders with a faint smile. Poro said. You sat here where we are now, mademoiselle, on the morning of the crime. You were seen here, or at least your sunshade was seen by Miss Brewster and Mr. Redfern as they passed on the sea. During the morning, mademoiselle, are you sure you did not happen to go down to Pixie Cove and enter the cave there, the famous Pixie's Cave? Rosamund turned her head and stared at him. She said in a quiet level voice. Are you asking me if I killed Arlena Marshall? No, I am asking you if you went into the Pixie's cave? I don't even know where it is. Why should I go into it? For what reason? On the day of the crime, mademoiselle, somebody had been in that cave who used Gabriel number 8. Rosamund said sharply. You've just said yourself, M. Poro, that Arlena Marshall used Gabriel number 8. She was on the beach there that day. Presumably she went into the cave. Why should she go into the cave? It is dark there and narrow and very uncomfortable. Rosamund said impatiently. Don't ask me for reasons. Since she was actually at the cove she was by far the most likely person. I've told you already I never left this place the whole morning. Except for the time when you went into the hotel to Captain Marshall's room. Poro reminded her. Yes, of course. I'd forgotten that. Poro said. And you were wrong, mademoiselle, when you thought that Captain Marshall did not see you. 
Rosamund said incredulously. Kenneth did see me? Did, did he say so? Poirot nodded. He saw you, Mademoiselle, in the mirror that hangs over the table. Rosamund caught her breath. She said. Oh. I see. Poirot was no longer looking out to sea. He was looking at Rosamund Darnley's hands as they lay folded in her lap. They were well-shaped hands, beautifully molded with very long fingers. Rosamund, shooting a quick look at him, followed the direction of his eyes. She said sharply. What are you looking at my hands for? Do you think, do you think? Poro said. Do I think, what, mademoiselle? Rosamund Darnley said. Nothing. It was perhaps an hour later that Hercule Poro came to the top of the path leading to Gull Cove. There was someone sitting on the beach. A slight figure in a red shirt and dark blue shorts. Poro descended the path, stepping carefully in his tight smart shoes. Linda Marshall turned her head sharply. He thought that she shrank a little. Her eyes, as he came and lowered himself gingerly to the shingle beside her, rested on him with the suspicion and alertness of a trapped animal. He realized, with a pang, how young and vulnerable she was. She said. What is it? What do you want? Hercule Poirot did not answer for a minute or two. Then he said. The other day you told the chief constable that you were fond of your stepmother and that she was kind to you. Well? That was not true, was it, mademoiselle? Yes, it was. Poirot said. She may not have been actively unkind, that I will grant. But you were not fond of her, oh no. I think you disliked her very much. That was very plain to see. Linda said. Perhaps I didn't like her very much. But one can't say that when a person is dead. It wouldn't be decent. Poro sighed. He said. They taught you that at your school? More or less, I suppose. Hercule Poro said. When a person has been murdered, it is more important to be truthful than to be decent. Linda said. I suppose you would say a thing like that. I would say it and I do say it. It is my business, you see, to find out who killed Arlena Marshall. Linda muttered. I want to forget it all. It's so horrible. Poro said gently. But you can't forget, can you? Linda said. I suppose some beastly madman killed her. Hercule Poro murmured. No, I do not think it was quite like that. Linda caught her breath. She said. You sound as though you knew? Poro said. Perhaps I do know. He paused and went on. Will you trust me, my child, to do the best I can for you in your bitter troop? Lou? Linda sprang up. She said. I haven't any trouble. There is nothing you can do for me. I don't know what you are talking about. Poro said, watching her. I am talking about candles. He saw the terror leap into her eyes. She cried. I won't listen to you. I won't listen. She ran across the beach, swift as a young gazelle and went flying up the zigzag path. Poro shook his head. He looked grave and troubled. 11. Inspector Colgate was reporting to the chief constable. I've got onto one thing, sir, and something pretty sensational. It's about Mrs. Marshall's money. I've been into it with her lawyers. I'd say it's a bit of a shock to them. I've got proof of the blackmail story. You remember she was left 50,000 pounds by old Erskine? Well, all that's left of that is about 15,000. The chief constable whistled. Phew, what's become of the rest? That's the interesting point, sir. She sold out stuff from time to time, and each time she's handled it in cash or negotiable securities, that's to say she's handed out money to someone that she didn't want traced. Blackmail all right. The chief constable nodded. Certainly looks like it and the blackmailer is here in this hotel. 
That means it must be one of those three men. Got anything fresh on any of them? Can't say I've got anything definite, sir. Major Barry's a retired army man, as he says. Lives in a small flat, has a pension and a small income from stocks. But he's paid in pretty considerable sums into his account in the last year. That sounds promising. What's his explanation? Says they're betting gains. It's perfectly true that he goes to all the large race meetings. Places his bets on the course too, doesn't run an account. The chief constable nodded. Hard to disprove that, he said. But it's suggestive. Colgate went on. Next, the Reverend Stephen Lane. He's bona fide all right, had a living at St. Helens, Whiteridge, Surrey, resigned his living just over a year ago owing to ill health. His ill health amounted to his going into a nursing home for mental patients. He was there for over a year. Interesting, said Weston. Yes, sir. I tried to get as much as I could out of the doctor in charge, but you know what these medicos are, it's difficult to pin them down to anything you can get hold of. But as far as I can make out, his reverence's trouble was an obsession about the devil, especially the devil in the guise of a woman, scarlet woman, whore of Babylon. Hum, said Weston. There have been precedents for murder there. Yes, sir. It seems to me that Stephen Lane is at least a possibility. The late Mrs. Marshall was a pretty good example of what a clergyman would call a scarlet woman, hair and goings on and all. Seems to me it's not impossible he may have felt it his appointed task to dispose of her. That is if he is really batty. Nothing to fit in with the blackmail theory? No, sir. I think we can wash him out as far as that's concerned. Has some private means of his own, but not very much, and no sudden increase lately. What about his story of his movements on the day of the crime? Can't get any confirmation of them. Nobody remembers meeting a parson in the lanes. As to the book at the church, the last entry was three days before and nobody had looked at it for about a fortnight. He could have quite easily gone over the day before, say, or even a couple of days before, and dated his entry the 25th. Weston nodded. He said. And the third man? Horace Blatt? It's my opinion, sir, that there's definitely something fishy there. Pays income tax on a sum far exceeding what he makes out of his hardware business. And mind you, he's a slippery customer. He could probably cook up a reasonable statement, he gambles a bit on the stock exchange and he's in with one or two shady deals. Oh, yes, there may be plausible explanations, but there's no getting away from it that he's been making pretty big sums from unexplained sources for some years now. In fact, said Weston, the idea is that Mr. Horace Blatt is a successful blackmailer by profession? Either that, sir, or it's dope. I saw Chief Inspector Ridgway who's in charge of the dope business, and he was no end keen. Seems there's been a good bit of heroin coming in lately. They're on to the small distributors, and they know more or less who's running at the other end, but it's the way it's coming into the country that's baffled them so far. Weston said. If the Marshall woman's death is the result of her getting mixed up, innocently or otherwise, with the dope running stunt, then we'd better hand the whole thing over to Scotland Yard. It's their pigeon. Eh? What do you say? Inspector Colgate said rather regretfully. I'm afraid you're right, sir. If it's dope, then it's a case for the yard. Weston said after a moment or two's thought. It really seems the most likely explanation. Colgate nodded gloomily. Yes, it does. Marshall's right out of it, though I did get some information that might have been useful if his alibi hadn't been so good. Seems his firm is very near the rocks. Not his fault or his partner's, just the general result of the crisis last year and the general state of trade and finance. And as far as he knew, he'd come into £50,000 if his wife died. And £50,000 would have been a very useful sum. He sighed. Seems a pity when a man's got two perfectly good motives for murder, that he can be proved to have had nothing to do with it. Weston smiled. 
Cheer up, Colgate. There's still a chance we may distinguish ourselves. There's the blackmail angle still, and there's the baddie parson, but, personally, I think the dope solution is far the most likely. He added, and if it was one of the dope gang who put her out will have been instrumental in helping Scotland Yard to solve the dope problem. In fact, take it all round, one way or another, we've done pretty well. An unwilling smile showed on Colgate's face. He said, Well, that's the lot, sir. By the way, I checked up on the writer of that letter we found in her room. The one signed J.N. Nothing doing. He's in China safe enough. Same chap as Miss Brewster was telling us about. Bit of a young scallywag. I've checked up on the rest of Mrs. Marshall's friends. No leads there. Everything there is to get, we've got, sir. Weston said. So now it's up to us. He paused and then added, seen anything of our Belgian colleague? Does he know all you've told me? Colgate said with a grin. He's a queer little cuss, isn't he? Do you know what he asked me day before yesterday? He wanted particulars of any cases of strangulation in the last three years. Colonel Weston sat up. He did, did he? Now I wonder, he paused a minute. When did you say the Reverend Stephen Lane went into that mental home? A year ago last Easter, sir. Colonel Weston was thinking deeply. He said, There was a case, body of a young woman found somewhere near Bagshot. Going to meet her husband somewhere and never turned up. And there was what the papers called the Lonely Cops Mystery both in Surrey if I remember rightly. His eyes met those of his inspector. Colgate said, Surrey? My word, sir, it fits, doesn't it? I wonder. Hercule Poirot sat on the turf on the summit of the island. A little to his left was the beginning of the steel ladder that led down to Pixie Co. V. There were several rough boulders near the head of the ladder, he noted, forming easy concealment for anyone who proposed to descend to the beach below. Of the beach itself little could be seen from the top owing to the overhang of the cliff. Hercule Poirot nodded his head gravely. The pieces of his jigsaw were fitting into position. Mentally he went over those pieces, considering each as a detached item. A morning on the bathing beach some few days before Arlena Marshall's death. One, two, three, four, five separate remarks uttered on that morning. The evening of a bridge game. He, Patrick Redfern and Rosamund Darnley had been at the table. Christine had wandered out while dummy and had overheard a certain conversation. Who else had been in the lounge at that time? Who had been absent? The evening before the crime. The conversation he had had with Christine on the cliff and the scene he had witnessed on his way back to the hotel. Gabriel number 8. A pair of scissors. A broken pipe stem. A bottle thrown from a window. A green calendar. A packet of candles. A mirror and a typewriter. A skein of magenta wool. A girl's wristwatch. Bath water rushing down the waste pipe. Each of these unrelated facts must fit into its appointed place. There must be no loose ends. And then, with each concrete fact fitted into position, onto the next stop, his own belief in the presence of evil on the island. Evil. He looked down at a typewritten paper in his hands. Nellie Parsons, found strangled in a lonely copse near Chobham. No clue to her murderer ever discovered. Nellie Parsons? Alice Corrigan. He read very carefully the details of Alice Corrigan's death. To Hercule Poirot, sitting on the ledge overlooking the sea, came Inspector Colgate. Poirot liked Inspector Colgate. He liked his rugged face, his shrewd eyes, and his slow unhurried manner. Inspector Colgate sat down. He said, glancing down at the typewritten sheets in Poirot's hand. Done anything with those cases, sir? I have studied them, yes. Colgate got up, he walked along and peered into the next niche. He came back, saying. 
one can't be too careful. Don't want to be overheard. Poro said. You are wise. Colgate said. I don't mind telling you, M. Poro, that I've been interested in those cases myself, though perhaps I shouldn't have thought about them if you hadn't asked for them. He paused. I've been interested in one case in particular. Alice Corrigan? Alice Corrigan. He paused. I've been on to the Surrey police about that case, wanted to get all the ins and outs of it. Tell me, my friend. I am interested, very interested. I thought you might be. Alice Corrigan was found strangled in Caesar's Grove on Blackridge Heath, not ten miles from Marley Copse where Nellie Parsons was found, and both those places are within twelve miles of Whiteridge where Mr. Lane was vicar. Poro said. Tell me more about the death of Alice Corrigan. Colgate said. The Surrey police didn't at first connect her death with that of Nellie Parsons. That's because they'd pitched on the husband as the guilty party. Don't quite know why except that he was a bit of what the press calls a mystery man, not much known about him, who he was or where he came from. She'd married him against her people's wishes, she'd a bit of money of her own, and she'd ensure her life in his favor, all that was enough to raise suspicion, as I think you'll agree, sir." Poro nodded. But when it came down to brass tacks the husband was washed right out of the picture. The body was discovered by one of these women hikers, hefty young women in shorts. She was an absolutely competent and reliable witness, games mistress at a school in Lancashire. She noted the time when she found the body, it was exactly 4.15, and gave it as her opinion that the woman had been dead quite a short time, not more than 10 minutes. That fitted in well enough with the police surgeon's view when he examined the body at 5.45. She left everything as it was and tramped across country to Bagshot Police Station where she reported the death. Now from 3 o'clock to 4.10, Edward Corrigan was in the train coming down from London where he'd gone up for the day on business. Four other people were in the carriage with him. From the station he took the local bus, two of his fellow passengers traveling by it also. He got off at the Pine Ridge Cafe where he'd arranged to meet his wife for tea. Time then was 4.25. He ordered tea for them both, but said not to bring it till she came. Then he walked about outside waiting for her. When, by five o'clock she hadn't turned up, he was getting alarmed, thought she might have sprained her ankle. The arrangement was that she was to walk across the moors from the village where they were staying to the Pine Ridge Cafe and go home by bus. Caesar's Grove is not far from the cafe, and it's thought that as she was ahead of time she sat down there to admire the view for a bit before going on and that some tramp or madman came upon her there and caught her unawares. Once the husband was proved to be out of it, naturally they connected up her death with that of Nellie Parsons, that rather flighty servant girl who was found strangled in Marley Copse. They decided that the same man was responsible for both crimes, but they never caught him, and what's more they never came near to catching him. Drew a blank everywhere. He paused and then he said slowly, and now, here's a third woman strangled, and a certain gentleman we won't name right on the spot. He stopped. His small shrewd eyes came round to Poirot. He waited hopefully. Poirot's lips moved. Inspector Colgate leaned forward. Poirot was murmuring. So difficult to know which pieces are part of the fur rug and which are the cat's tail. I beg pardon, sir, said Inspector Colgate, startled. Poro said quickly. I apologize. I was following a train of thought of my own. What's this about a fur rug and a cat? Nothing, nothing at all. He paused. Tell me, Inspector Colgate, if you suspected someone of telling lies, many, many lies, but you had no proof, what would you do? Inspector Colgate considered. It's difficult, that is. But it's my opinion that if anyone tells enough lies, they're bound to trip up in the end." Poro nodded. Yes, that is very true. You see, it is only in my mind that certain statements are lies. I think that they are lies, but I cannot know that they are lies. But one might perhaps make a test, 
a test of one little not very noticeable lie. And if that were proved to be a lie, why then, one would know that all the rest were lies, too. Inspector Colgate looked at him curiously. Your mind works a funny way, doesn't it, sir? But I dare say it comes out all right in the end. If you'll excuse me asking, what put you on to asking about strangulation cases in general? Poro said slowly. You have a word in your language, slick. This crime seemed to me a very slick crime. It made me wonder if, perhaps, it was not a first attempt. Inspector Colgate said. I see. Poro went on. I said to myself, let us examine past crimes of a similar kind, and if there is a crime that closely resembles this one, eh bien, we shall have there a very valuable clue. You mean using the same method of death, sir? No, no, I mean more than that. The death of Nellie Parsons for instance tells me nothing. But the death of Alice Corrigan, tell me, Inspector Colgate, do you not notice one striking form of similarity in this crime? Inspector Colgate turned the problem over in his mind. He said at last. No, sir, I can't say that I do really. Unless it's that in each case the husband has got a cast iron alibi. Poro said softly. Ah, so you have noticed that? Ha, ah, Poro. Glad to see you. Come in. Just the man I want. Hercule Poro responded to the invitation. The chief constable pushed over a box of cigarettes, took one himself and lighted it. Between puffs he said. I've decided, more or less, on a course of action. But I'd like your opinion on it before I act decisively. Hercule Poro said. Tell me, my friend. Weston said. I've decided to call in Scotland Yard and hand the case over to them. In my opinion, although there have been grounds for suspicion against one or two people, the whole case hinges on dope smuggling. It seems clear to me that that place, Pixie's Cave, was a definite rendezvous for the stuff. Poro nodded. I agree. Good man. And I'm pretty certain who our dope smuggler is. Horace Blatt. Again Poro assented. He said. That, too, is indicated. I see our minds have both worked the same way. Blatt used to go sailing in that boat of his. Sometimes he'd invite people to go with him, but most of the time he went out alone. He had some rather conspicuous red sails on that boat, but we found that he had some white sails as well stowed away. I think he sailed out on a good day to an appointed spot, and was met by another boat, sailing boat or motor yacht, something of the kind and the stuff was handed over. Then Blatt would run ashore into Pixie Cove at a suitable time of day. Hercule Poro smiled. Yes, yes, at half past one. The hour of the British lunch when everyone is quite sure to be in the dining room. The island is private. It is not a place where outsiders come for picnics. People take their tea sometimes from the hotel to Pixie Cove in the afternoon when the sun is on it, or if they want a picnic they would go somewhere far af. Eeld, many miles away. The chief constable nodded. Quite, he said. Therefore, Blatt ran ashore there and stowed the stuff on that ledge in the cave. Somebody else was to pick it up there in due course. Poro murmured. There was a couple, you remember, who came to the island for lunch on the day of the murder. That would be a way of getting the stuff. Some summer visitors from a hotel on the moor or at St. Lou come over to Smuggler's Island. They announce that they will have lunch. They walk round the island first. How easy to descend to the beach, pick up the sandwich box, place it, no doubt, in Madame's bathing bag which she carries, and return for lunch to the hotel, a little late, perhaps, say at ten minutes to two, having enjoyed their walk whilst everyone else was in the dining room. Weston said. Yes, it all sounds practicable enough. Now these dope organizations are pretty ruthless. If anyone blundered in and got wise to things they wouldn't make any bones about silencing that person. It seems to me that that is the right explanation of Arlena Marshall's death. 
it's possible that on that morning Blatt was actually at the cove stowing the stuff away. His accomplices were a comfort that very day. Arlene arrives on her float and sees him going into the cave with the box. She asks him about it and he kills her then and there and shears off in his boat as quick as possible. Poro said. You think definitely that Blatt is the murderer? It seems the most probable solution. Of course it's possible that Arlena might have got onto the truth earlier, said something to Blatt about it, and some other member of the gang fixed a fake appointment with her and did her in. As I say, I think the best course is to hand the case over to Scotland Yard. They've a far better chance than we have of proving Blatt's connection with the gang. Hercule Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Weston said. You think that's the wise thing to do, eh? Poro was thoughtful. He said at last, it may be. Dash it all, Poro, have you got something up your sleeve, or haven't you? Poro said gravely. If I have, I am not sure that I can prove it. Weston said. Of course, I know that you and Colgate have other ideas. Seems a bit fantastic to me, but I'm bound to admit there may be something in it. But even if you're right, I still think it's a case for the yard. We'll give them the facts and they can work in with the Surrey police. What I feel is that it isn't really a case for us. It's not sufficiently localized. He paused. What do you think, Poro? What do you feel ought to be done about it? Poro seemed lost in thought. At last he said. I know what I should like to do. Yes, man. Poro murmured. I should like to go for a picnic. Colonel Weston stared at him. Twelve. A picnic, M. Poirot? Emily Brewster stared at him as though he were out of his senses. Poirot said engagingly. It sounds to you, does it not, very outrageous? But indeed it seems to me a most admirable idea. We need something of the everyday, the usual, to restore life to the normal. I am most anxious to see something of Dartmoor, the weather is good. It will, how shall I say, it will cheer everybody up. So aid me in this matter. Persuade everyone. The idea met with unexpected success. Everyone was at first dubious and then grudgingly admitted it might not be such a bad idea after all. It was not suggested that Captain Marshall should be asked. He had himself announced that he had to go to Plymouth that day. Mr. Blatt was of the party, enthusiastically so. He was determined to be the life and soul of it. Besides him there was Emily Brewster, the Redferns, Stephen Lane, the Gardeners, who were persuaded to delay their departure by one day, Rosamund Darnley, and Linda. Poro had been eloquent to Rosamund and had dwelt on the advantage it would be to Linda to have something to take her out of herself. To this Rosamund agreed. She said. You're quite right. The shock has been very bad for a child of that age. It has made her terribly jumpy. That is only natural, mademoiselle. But at any age one soon forgets. Persuade her to come. You can, I know. Major Barry had refused firmly. He said he didn't like picnics. Lots of baskets to carry, he said. And darn uncomfortable. Eating my food at a table's good enough for me. The party assembled at 10 o'clock. Three cars had been ordered. Mr. Blatt was loud and cheerful, imitating a tourist guide. This way, ladies and gentlemen, this way for Dartmoor. Heather and Bilberries, Devonshire Cream and Convicts. Bring your wives, gentlemen, or bring the other thing. Everyone welcome. Scenery guaranteed. Walk up. Walk up. At the last minute Rosamund Darnley came down looking concerned. She said. Linda's not coming. She says she's got a frightful headache. Poro cried. But it will do her good to come. Persuade her, mademoiselle. Rosamund said firmly. It's no good. She's absolutely determined. I've given her some aspirin and she's gone to bed. She hesitated and said. 
I think, perhaps, I won't go, either. Can't allow that, dear lady, can't allow that, cried Mr. Blatt, seizing her facetiously by the arm. La Hope Mode must grace the occasion. No refusals. I've taken you into custody, ha, ha. Sentence to Dartmoor. He led her firmly to the first car. Rosamond threw a black look at Hercule Poirot. I'll stay with Linda, said Christine Redfern. I don't mind a bit. Patrick said, oh, come on, Christine. And Poirot said. No, no, you must come, madam. With a headache one is better alone. Come, let us start. The three cars drove off. They went first to the real Pixies Cave on Sheepster, and had a good deal of fun looking for the entrance and at last finding it, aided by a picture postcard. It was precarious going on the big boulders and Hercule Poirot did not attempt it. He watched indulgently while Christine Redfern sprang lightly from stone to stone and observed that her husband was never far from her. Rosamund Darnley and Emily Brewster had joined in the search though the latter slipped once and gave a slight twist to her ankle. Stephen Lane was indefatigable, his long lean figure turning and twisting among the boulders. Mr. Black contented himself with going a little way and shouting encouragement, also taking photographs of the searchers. The gardeners and Poirot remained stately sitting by the wayside whilst Mrs. Gardner's voice upraised itself in a pleasant even-toned monologue, punctuated now and then by the obedient yes, darlings of her spouse. And what I always have felt, M. Poirot, and Mr. Gardner agrees with me, is that snapshots can be very annoying. Unless, that is to say, they are taken among friends. That Mr. Blatt has just no sensitiveness of any kind. He just comes right up to everyone and talks away and takes pictures of you and, as I said to Mr. Gardner, that really is very ill-bred. That's what I said, Odell, wasn't it? Yes, darling. That group he took of us all sitting on the beach. Well, that's all very well, but he should have asked first. As it was, Miss Brewster was just getting up from the beach, and it certainly makes her look a very peculiar shape. I'll say it does, said Mr. Gardner with a grin. And there's Mr. Blatt giving round copies to everybody without so much as asking first. He gave one to you, M. Poirot, I noticed. Poirot nodded. He said. I value that group very much. Mrs. Gardner went on. And look at his behavior. Today, so loud and noisy and common. Why, it just makes me shudder. You ought to have arranged to leave that man at home, M. Poirot. Hercule Poirot murmured. Alas, madam, that would have been difficult. I should say it would. That man just pushes his way in anywhere. He's just not sensitive at all. At this moment the discovery of the Pixies Cave was hailed from below with loud cries. The party now drove on, under Hercule Poirot's directions to a spot where a short walk from the car down a hillside of heather led to a delightful spot by a small river. A narrow plank bridge crossed the river and Poirot and her husband induced Mrs. Gardner to cross it to where a delightful heathery spot free from prickly firs looked an ideal spot for a picnic lunch. Talking volubly about her sensations when crossing on a plank bridge Mrs. Gardner sank down. Suddenly there was a slight outcry. The others had run across the bridge lightly enough, but Emily Brewster was standing in the middle of the plank, her eyes shut, swaying to and fro. Poirot and Patrick Redfern rushed to the rescue. Emily Brewster was gruff and ashamed. Thanks, thanks. Sorry. Never was good at crossing running water. Get giddy. Stupid, very. Lunch was spread out and the picnic began. All the people concerned were secretly surprised to find how much they enjoyed this interlude. It was, perhaps, because it afforded an escape from an atmosphere of suspicion and dread. Here, with the trickling of the water, the soft peaty smell in the air and the warm coloring of bracken and heather, a world of murder and police inquiries and suspicion seemed blotted out as though it had never existed. Even Mr. Blatt forgot to be the life and soul of the party. 
After lunch he went to sleep a little distance away and subdued snores testified to his blissful unconsciousness. It was quite a grateful party of people who packed up the picnic baskets and congratulated Hercule Poirot on his good idea. The sun was sinking as they returned along the narrow winding lanes. From the top of the hill above Leathercombe Bay they had a brief glimpse of the island with the white hotel on it. It looked peaceful and innocent in the setting sun. Mrs. Gardner, not loquacious for once, sighed and said. I really do thank you, M. Poirot. I feel so calm. It's just wonderful. Major Barry came out to greet them on arrival. Hello, he said. Had a good day? Mrs. Gardner said. Indeed we did. The moors were just too lovely for anything. So English and old world. And the air delicious and invigorating. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for being so lazy as to stay behind. The major chuckled. I'm too old for that kind of thing, sitting on a patch of bog and eating sandwiches. A chambermaid had come out of the hotel. She was a little out of breath. She hesitated for a moment then came swiftly up to Christine Redfern. Hercule Poirot recognized her as Glady's Naricot. Her voice came quick and uneven. Excuse me, madam, but I'm worried about the young lady. About Miss Marshall. I took her up some tea just now and I couldn't get her awake, and she looks so, so queer somehow. Christine looked round helplessly. Poirot was at her side in a moment. His hand under her elbow he said quietly. We will go up and see. They hurried up the stairs and along the passage to Linda's room. One glance at her was enough to tell them both that something was very wrong. She was an odd color and her breathing was hardly perceptible. Poirot's hand went to her pulse. At the same time he noticed an envelope stuck up against the lamp on the bedside table. It was addressed to himself. Captain Marshall came quickly into the room. He said. What's this about Linda? What's the matter with her? A small frightened sob came from Christine Redfern. Hercule Poirot turned from the bed. He said to Marshall. Get a doctor, as quick as you possibly can. But I'm afraid, very much afraid, it may be too late. He took the letter with his name on it and ripped open the envelope. Inside were a few lines of writing in Linda's prim schoolgirl hand. I think this is the best way out. Ask father to try and forgive me. I killed Arlena. I thought I should be glad, but I'm not. I am very sorry for everything. They were assembled in the lounge, Marshall, the Red Ferns, Rosamund Darnley, and Hercule Poirot. They sat there silent, waiting. The door opened and Dr. Neeston came in. He said curtly. I've done all I can. She may pull through, but I'm bound to tell you that there's not much hope. He paused. Marshall, his face stiff, his eyes a cold frosty blue, asked. How did she get hold of the stuff? Neeston opened the door again and beckoned. The chambermaid came into the room. She had been crying. Neeston said. Just tell us again what you saw. Sniffing, the girl said. I never thought, I never thought for a minute there was anything wrong, though the young lady did seem rather strange about it. A slight gesture of impatience from the doctor started her off again. She was in the other lady's room. Mrs. Redfern's. Your room, madam. Over at the washstand, and she took up a little bottle. She did give a bit of a jump when I came in, and I thought it was queer her taking things from your room, but then, of course, it might be something she'd lent you. She just said, oh, this is what I'm looking for, and went out. Christine said almost in a whisper. My sleeping tablets. The doctor said brusquely. How did she know about them? Christine said. I gave her one. The night after it happened. She told me she couldn't sleep. She, I remember her saying, will one be enough? And I said, oh yes, they were very strong, that I'd been cautioned never to take more than two at most. Neeson nodded, 
She made pretty sure, he said. Took six of them. Christine sobbed again. Oh dear, I feel it's my fault. I should have kept them locked up. The doctor shrugged his shoulders. It might have been wiser, Mrs. Redfern. Christine said despairingly. She's dying, and it's my fault. Kenneth Marshall stirred in his chair. He said. No, you can't blame yourself. Linda knew what she was doing. She took them deliberately. Perhaps, perhaps it was best. He looked down at the crumpled note in his hand, the note that Poirot had silently handed to him. Rosamund Darnley cried out. I don't believe it. I don't believe Linda killed her. Surely it's impossible, on the evidence. Christine said eagerly. Yes, she can't have done it. She must have got overwrought and imagined it all. The door opened and Colonel Weston came in. He said. What's all this I hear? Dr. Neeston took the note from Marshall's hand and handed it to the chief constable. The latter read it. He exclaimed incredulously. What? But this is nonsense, absolute nonsense. It's impossible. He repeated with assurance. Impossible. Isn't it, Poirot? Hercule Poirot moved for the first time. He said in a slow sad voice. No, I'm afraid it is not impossible. Christine Redfern said. But I was with her, M. Poirot. I was with her up to a quarter to twelve. I told the police so. Poirot said. Your evidence gave her an alibi, yes. But what was your evidence based on? It was based on Linda Marshall's own wristwatch. You do not know of your own knowledge that it was a quarter to twelve when you left her, you only know that she told you so. You said yourself the time seemed to have gone very fast. She stared at him, stricken. He said. Now, think, madam, when you left the beach, did you walk back to the hotel fast or slow? I, well, fairly slowly, I think. Do you remember much about that walk back? Not very much, I'm afraid. I, I was thinking. Poro said. I am sorry to ask you this, but will you tell just what you were thinking about during that walk? Christine flushed. I suppose, if it is necessary. I was considering the question of, of leaving here. Just going away without telling my husband. I, I was very unhappy just then, you see. Patrick Redfern cried. Oh, Christine. I know. I know. Poro's precise voice cut in. Exactly. You were concerned over taking a step of some importance. You were, I should say, deaf and blind to your surroundings. You probably walked very slowly and occasionally stopped for some minutes whilst you puzzled things out. Christine nodded. How clever you are. It was just like that. I woke up from a kind of dream just outside the hotel and hurried in thinking I should be very late, but when I saw the clock in the lounge I realized I had plenty of time. Hercule Poirot said again. Exactly. He turned to Marshall. I must now describe to you certain things I found in your daughter's room after the murder. In the grate was a large blob of melted wax, some burnt hair, fragments of cardboard and paper and an ordinary household pin. The paper and the cardboard might not be relevant, but the other three things were suggestive, particularly when I found tucked away in the bookshelf a volume from the local library here dealing with witchcraft and magic. It opened very easily at a certain page. On that page were described various methods of causing death by molding and was a figure supposed to represent the victim. This was then slowly roasted till it melt. D away, or alternatively you would pierce the wax figure to the heart with a pin. Death of the victim would ensue. I later heard from Mrs. Redfern that Linda Marshall had been out early that morning and had bought a packet of candles, and had seemed embarrassed when her purchase was revealed. I had no doubt what had happened after that. Linda had made a crude figure of the candle wax, possibly adorning it with a snip of Arlena's red hair to give the magic force, 
had then stabbed it to the heart with a pin and finally melted the figure away by lighting strips of cardboard under it. It was crude, childish, superstitious, but it revealed one thing, the desire to kill. Was there any possibility that there had been more than a desire? Could Linda Marshall have actually killed her stepmother? At first sight it seemed as though she had a perfect alibi, but in actuality, as I have just pointed out, the time evidence was supplied by Linda herself. She could easily have declared the time to be a quarter of an hour later than it really was. It was quite possible once Mrs. Redfern had left the beach for Linda to follow her up and then strike across the narrow neck of land to the ladder, hurry down it, meet her stepmother there, strangle her and return up the ladder before the boat containing Miss Brewster and Patrick Redfern came in sight. She could then return to Gull Cove, take her bathe and return to the hotel at her leisure. But that entailed two things. She must have definite knowledge that Arlena Marshall would be at Pixie Cove and she must be physically capable of the deed. Well, the first was quite possible, if Linda Marshall had written a note to Arlena herself in someone else's name. As to the second, Linda has very large strong hands. They are as large as a man's. As to the strength, she is at the age when one is prone to be mentally unbalanced. Mental derangement often is accompanied by unusual strength. There was one other small point. Linda Marshall's mother had actually been accused and tried for murder. Kenneth Marshall lifted his head. He said fiercely, she was also acquitted. She was acquitted, Poirot agreed. Marshall said. And I'll tell you this, M. Poirot. Ruth, my wife, was innocent. That I know with complete and absolute certainty. In the intimacy of our life I could not have been deceived. She was an innocent victim of circumstances. He paused. And I don't believe that Linda killed Arlena. It's ridiculous, absurd. Poro said. Do you believe that letter, then, to be a forgery? Marshall held out his hand for it and Weston gave it to him. Marshall studied it attentively. Then he shook his head. No, he said unwillingly. I believe Linda did write this. Poro said. Then if she wrote it, there are only two explanations. Either she wrote it in all good faith, knowing herself to be the murderess or, or, I say, she wrote it deliberately to shield someone else, someone whom she feared was suspected. Kenneth Marshall said. You mean me? It is possible, is it not? Marshall considered for a moment or two, then he said quietly. No, I think that idea is absurd. Linda may have realized that I was regarded with suspicion at first. But she knew definitely by now that that was over and done with, that the police had accepted my alibi and turned their attention elsewhere. Poro said. And supposing that it was not so much that she thought that you were suspected as that she knew you were guilty. Marshall stared at him. He gave a short laugh. That's absurd. Poro said. I wonder. There are, you know, several possibilities about Mrs. Marshall's death. There's the theory that she was being blackmailed, that she went that morning to meet the blackmailer and that the blackmailer killed her. There's the theory that Pixie Cove and Cave were being used for drug running, and that she was killed because she accidentally learned something about that. There is a third possibility, that she was killed by a religious maniac. And there is a fourth possibility, you stood to gain a lot of money by your wife's death, Captain Marshall? I've just told you. Yes, yes, I agree that it is impossible that you could have killed your wife, if you were acting alone. But supposing someone helped you? What the devil do you mean? The quiet man was roused at last. He half rose from his chair. His voice was menacing. There was a hard angry light in his eyes. Poro said. I mean that this is not a crime that was committed single-handed. Two people were in it. It is quite true that you could not have typed that letter and at the same time gone to the cove, but there would have been time for you to have jotted down that letter in shorthand, and for someone else to have typed it in your room while you yourself were absent on your murderous errand. Hercule Poirot looked towards Rosamund Darnley. 
he said. Miss Darnley states that she left Sunny Ledge at 10 minutes past 11 and saw you typing in your room. But just about that time Mr. Gardner went up to the hotel to fetch a skein of wool for his wife. He did not meet Miss Darnley or see her. That is rather remarkable. It looks as though either Miss Darnley never left Sunny Ledge, or else she had left it much earlier and was in your room typing industriously. Another point, you stated that when Miss Darnley looked into your room at a quarter past eleven you saw her in the mirror. But on the day of the murder your typewriter and papers were all on the writing desk across the corner of the room, whereas the mirror was between the windows. So that statement was a deliberate lie. Later, you moved your typewriter to the table under the mirror so as to substantiate your story, but it was too late. I was aware that both you and Miss Darnley had lied. Rosamund Darnley spoke. Her voice was low and clear. She said. How devilishly ingenious you are. Hercule Poirot said, raising his voice. But not so devilish and so ingenious as the man who killed Arlena Marshall. Think back for a moment. Who did I think, who did everybody think, that Arlena Marshall had gone to meet that morning? We all jumped to the same conclusion. Patrick Redfern. It was not to meet a blackmailer that she went. Her face alone would have told me that. Oh no, it was a lover she was going to meet, or thought she was going to meet. Yes, I was quite sure of that. Arlena Marshall was going to meet Patrick Redfern. But a minute later Patrick Redfern appeared on the beach and was obviously looking for her. So what then? Patrick Redfern said with subdued anger. Some devil used my name. Poro said. You were very obviously upset and surprised by her non-appearance. Almost too obviously, perhaps. It is my theory, Mr. Redfern, that she went to Pixie Cove to meet you, and that she did meet you, and that you killed her there as you had planned to do. Patrick Redfern stared. He said in his high good-humored Irish voice. Is it daft you are? I was with you on the beach until I went round in the boat with Miss Brewster and found her dead. Hercule Poirot said. You killed her after Miss Brewster had gone off in the boat to fetch the police. Arlena Marshall was not dead when you got to the beach. She was waiting hidden in the cave until the coast could be clear. But the body. Miss Brewster and I both saw the body. A body, yes. But not a dead body. The live body of the woman who helped you, her arms and legs stained with tan, her face hidden by a green cardboard hat. Christine, your wife, or possibly not your wife, but still your partner, helping you to commit this crime as she helped you to commit that crime in the past when she discovered the body of Alice Corrigan at least 20 minutes before Alice Corrigan died, killed by her husband Edward Corrigan, you. Christine spoke. Her voice was sharp, cold. She said. Be careful, Patrick, don't lose your temper. Poro said. You will be interested to hear that both you and your wife Christine were easily recognized and picked out by the Surrey police from a group of people photographed here. They identified you both at once as Edward Corrigan and Christine de Verrill, the young woman who found the body. Patrick Redfern had risen. His handsome face was transformed, suffused with blood blind with rage. It was the face of a killer, of a tiger. He yelled. You damned interfering murdering lousy little worm. He hurled himself forward, his fingers stretching and curling, his voice raving curses, as he fastened his fingers round Hercule Poro's throat. 13. Poro said reflectively. It was on a morning when we were sitting out here that we talked of suntan bodies lying like meat upon a slab and it was then that I reflected how little difference there was between one body and another. If one looked closely and appraisingly, yes, but to the casual glance? One moderately well-made young woman is very like another. Two brown legs, two brown arms, a little piece of bathing suit in between, just a body lying out in the sun. When a woman walks, when she speaks, laughs, turns her head, moves a hand, then, yes then, there is personality, individuality. But in the sun ritual, no. 
It was that day that we spoke of evil, evil under the sun as Mr. Lane put it. Mr. Lane is a very sensitive person, evil affects him, he perceives its presence, but though he is a good recording instrument, he did not really know exactly where the evil was. To him, evil was focused in the person of Arlena Marshall, and practically everyone present agreed with him. But to my mind, though evil was present, it was not centralized in Arlena Marshall at all. It was connected with her, yes, but in a totally different way. I saw her, first, last and all the time, as an eternal and predestined victim. Because she was beautiful, because she had glamour, because men turned their heads to look at her, it was assumed that she was the type of woman who wrecked lives and destroyed souls. But I saw her very differently. It was not she who fatally attracted men, it was men who fatally attracted her. She was the type of woman whom men care for easily, and of whom they as easily tire. And everything that I was told or found out about her strengthened my conviction on this point. The first thing that was mentioned about her was how the man in whose divorce case she had been cited refused to marry her. It was then that Captain Marshall, one of those incurably chivalrous men, stepped in and asked her to marry him. To a shy retiring man of Captain Marshall's type, a public ordeal of any kind would be the worst torture, hence his love and pity for his first wife who was publicly accused and tried for a murder she had not committed. He married her and found himself amply justified in his estimate of her character. After her death another beautiful woman, perhaps something of the same type, since Linda has red hair which she probably inherited from her mother, is held up to public ignominy. Again Marshall performs a rescue act. But this time he finds little to sustain his infatuation. Arlena is stupid, unworthy of his sympathy and protection, mindless. Nevertheless, I think he always had a fairly true vision of her. Long after he ceased to love her and was irked by her presence, he remained sorry for her. She was to him like a child who cannot get farther than a certain page in the book of life. I saw an Arlena Marshall with her passion for men, a predestined prey for an unscrupulous man of a certain type. In Patrick Redfern, with his good looks, his easy assurance, his undeniable charm for women, I recognized at once that type. The adventurer who makes his living, one way or another, out of women. Looking on from my place on the beach I was quite certain that Arlena was Patrick's victim, not the other way about. And I associated that focus of evil with Patrick Redfern, not with Arlena Marshall. Arlena had recently come into a large sum of money, left her by an elderly admirer who had not had time to grow tired of her. She was the type of woman who was invariably defrauded of money by some man or other. Miss Brewster mentioned a young man who had been ruined by Arlena, but a letter from him which was found in her room, though it expressed a wish, which cost nothing, to cover her with jewels, in actual fact acknowledged a check from her by means of which he hoped to escape prosecution. A clear case of a young waster sponging on her. I have no doubt that Patrick Redfern found it easy to induce her to hand him large sums from time to time for investment. He probably dazzled her with stories of great opportunities, how he would make her fortune and his own. Unprotected women, living alone, are easy prey to that type of man, and he usually escapes scot-free with the booty. If, however, there is a husband, or a brother, or a father about, things are apt to take an unpleasant turn for the swindler. Once Captain Marshall was to find out what had happened to his wife's fortune, Patrick Redfern might expect short shrift. That did not worry him, however, because he contemplated quite calmly doing away with her when he judged it necessary, encouraged by having already got away with one murder, that of a young woman whom he had married in the name of Corgan and whom he had persuaded to insure her life for a large sum. In his plans he was aided and abetted by the woman who down here passed as his wife and to whom he was genuinely attached. A young woman as unlike the type of his victims as could well be imagined, cool, calm, passionless, but steadfastly loyal to him and an actress of no mean ability. From the time of her arrival here Christine Redfern played a part, the part of the poor little wife, frail, helpless, intellectual rather than athletic. Think of the points she made one after another. Her tendency to blister in the sun and her consequent white skin, 
her giddiness at heights, stories of getting stuck on Milan Cathedral, etc. An emphasis on her frailty and delicacy, nearly everyone spoke of her as a little woman. She was actually as tall as Arlena Marshall, but with very small hands and feet. She spoke of herself as a former school teacher, and thereby emphasized an impression of book learning and lack of athletic prowess. Actually, it is quite true that she had worked in a school, but the position she held there was that of games mistress, and she was an extremely active young woman who could climb like a cat and run like an athlete. The crime itself was perfectly planned and timed. It was, as I mentioned before, a very slick crime. The timing was a work of genius. First of all there were certain preliminary scenes, one played on the cliff ledge when they knew me to be occupying the next recess, a conventional jealous wife dialogue between her and her husband. Later she played the same part in a scene with me. At the time I remember a vague feeling of having read all this in a book. It did not seem real. Because, of course, it was not real. Then came the day of the crime. It was a fine day, an essential. Redfern's first act was to slip out very early, by the balcony door which he unlocked from the inside, if found open it would only be thought someone had gone for an early bath. Under his bathing wrap he concealed a green Chinese hat, the duplicate of the one Arlena was in the habit of wearing. He slipped across the island, down the ladder and stowed it away in an appointed place behind some rocks. Part 1. On the previous evening he had arranged a rendezvous with Arlena. They were exercising a good deal of caution about meeting as Arlena was slightly afraid of her husband. She agreed to go round to Pixie Cove early. Nobody went there in the morning. Redfern was to join her there, taking a chance to slip away unobtrusively. If she heard anyone descending the ladder or a boat came in sight she was to slip inside the Pixie's cave, the secret of which he had told her, and wait there until the coast was clear. Part 2 in the meantime Christine went to Linda's room at a time when she judged Linda would have gone for her early morning dip. She would then alter Linda's watch, putting it on 20 minutes. There was, of course, a risk that Linda might notice her watch was wrong, but it did not much matter if she did. Christine's real alibi was the size of her hands which made it a physical impossibility for her to have committed the crime. Nevertheless, an additional alibi would be desirable. Then in Linda's room she noticed the book on witchcraft and magic, open at a certain page. She read it, and when Linda came in and dropped a parcel of candles she realized what was in Linda's mind. It opened up some new ideas to her. The original idea of the guilty pair had been to cast a reasonable amount of suspicion on Kenneth Marshall, hence the abstracted pipe, a fragment of which was to be planted on the cove underneath the ladder. On Linda's return Christine easily arranged an outing together to Gull Cove. She then returned to her own room, took out from a locked suitcase a bottle of artificial suntan, applied it carefully and threw the empty bottle out of the window where it narrowly escaped hitting Emily Brewster who was bathing. Part 2 Successfully Accomplished Christine then dressed herself in a white bathing suit and over it a pair of beach trousers and coat with long floppy sleeves which effectually concealed her newly browned arms and legs. At 10.15 Arlena departed for her rendezvous, a minute or two later Patrick Redfern came down and registered surprise, annoyance etc. Christine's task was easy enough. Keeping her own watch concealed she asked Linda at 25 past 11 what time it was. Linda looked at her watch and replied that it was a quarter to twelve. She then starts down to the sea and Christine packs up her sketching things. As soon as Linda's back is turned Christine picks up the girl's watch which she has necessarily discarded before going into the sea and alters it back to the correct time. Then she hurries up the cliff path, runs across the narrow neck of land to the top of the ladder, strips off her pajamas and shoves them and her sketching box behind a rock and swarms rapidly down the ladder in her best gymnastic fashion. Arlena is on the beach below wondering why Patrick is so long in coming. She sees or hears someone on the ladder, takes a cautious observation, and to her annoyance sees that inconvenient person, the wife. 
she hurries along the beach and into the pixie's cave. Christine takes the hat from its hiding place, a false red curl pinned underneath the brim at the back, and disposes herself in a sprawling attitude with the hat and curl shielding her face and neck. The timing is perfect. A minute or two later the boat containing Patrick and Emily Brewster comes round the point. Remember it is Patrick who bends down and examines the body, Patrick who is stunned, shocked, broken down by the death of his lady love. His witness has been carefully chosen. Miss Brewster has not got a good head, she will not attempt to go up the ladder. She will leave the cove by boat, Patrick naturally being the one to remain with the body, in case the murderer may still be about. Miss Brewster rows off to fetch the police. Christine, as soon as the boat has disappeared, springs up, cuts the hat into pieces with the scissors Patrick has carefully brought, stuffs them into her bathing suit and swarms up the ladder in double quick time, slips into her beach pajamas and runs back to the hotel. Just time to have a quick bath, washing off the brown suntan application, and into her tennis dress. One other thing she does. She burns the pieces of the green cardboard hat and the hair in Linda's grate, adding a leaf of a calendar so that it may be associated with the cardboard. Not a hat but a calendar has been burnt. As she suspected, Linda has been experimenting in magic, the blob of wax and the pin shows that. Then, down to the tennis court, A. Riving the last, but showing no signs of flurry or haste. And, meanwhile, Patrick has gone to the cave. Arlena has seen nothing and heard very little, a boat, voices, she has prudently remained hidden. But now it is Patrick calling. All clear, darling, and she comes out, and his hands fasten round her neck, and that is the end of poor foolish beautiful Arlena Marshall. His voice died away. For a moment there was silence, then Rosamund Darnley said with a little shiver. Yes you make one see it all. But that's the story from the other side. You haven't told us how you came to get at the truth? Hercule Poirot said. I told you once that I had a very simple mind. Always, from the beginning, it seemed to me that the most likely person had killed Arlena Marshall. And the most likely person was Patrick Redfern. He was the type, par excellence, the type of man who exploits women like her, and the type of the killer, the kind of man who will take a woman's savings and cut her throat into the bargain. Who was Arlena going to meet that morning? By the evidence of her face, her smile, her manner, her words to me, Patrick Redfern. And therefore, in the very nature of things, it should be Patrick who killed her. But at once I came up, as I told you, against impossibility. Patrick Redfern could not have killed her since he was on the beach and in Miss Brewster's company until the actual discovery of the body. So I looked about for other solutions, and there were several. She could have been killed by her husband, with Miss Darnley's connivance. They too had both lied as to one point which looked suspicious. She could have been killed as a result of her having stumbled on the secret of the dope smuggling. She could have been killed, as I said by a religious maniac, and she could have been killed by her stepdaughter. The latter seemed to me at one time to be the real solution. Linda's manner in her very first interview with the police was significant. An interview that I had with her later assured me of one point. Linda considered herself guilty. You mean she imagined that she had actually killed Arlena? Rosamund's voice was incredulous. Hercule Poirot nodded. Yes. Remember, she is really little more than a child. She read that book on witchcraft and she half believed it. She hated Arlena. She deliberately made the wax doll, cast her spell, pierced it to the heart, melted it away, and that very day Arlena dies. Older and wiser people than Linda have believed fervently in magic. Naturally, she believed that it was all true, that by using magic she had killed her stepmother. Rosamund cried. Oh, poor child, poor child. And I thought, I imagined, something quite different, that she knew something which would. Rosamund stopped. Poro said. I know what it was you thought. Actually your manner frightened Linda still further. 
she believed that her action had really brought about Arlena's death and that you knew it. Christine Redfern worked on her too, introducing the idea of the sleeping tablets to her mind, showing her the way to a speedy and painless expiation of her crime. You see, once Captain Marshall was proved to have an alibi, it was vital for a new suspect to be found. Neither she nor her husband knew about the dope smuggling. They fixed on Linda to be the scapegoat. Rosamund said. What a devil! Poro nodded. Yes, you are right. A cold-blooded and cruel woman. For me, I was in great difficulty. Was Linda guilty only of the childish attempt at witchcraft, or had her hate carried her still further, to the actual act? I tried to get her to confess to me. But it was no good. At that moment I was in grave uncertainty. The chief constable was inclined to accept the dope smuggling explanation. I couldn't let it go at that. I went over the facts again very carefully. I had, you see, a collection of jigsaw puzzle pieces, isolated happenings, plain facts. The whole must fit into a complete and harmonious pattern. There were the scissors found on the beach, a bottle thrown from a window, a bath that no one would admit to having taken, all perfectly harmless occurrences in themselves, but rendered significant by the fact that no one would admit to them. Therefore, they must be of significance. Nothing about them fitted in with the theories of either Captain Marshall's or Linda's, or of a dope gang's being responsible. And yet they must have meaning. I went back again to my first solution, that Patrick Redfern had committed the murder. Was there anything in support of that? Yes, the fact that a very large sum of money was missing from Arlena's account. Who had got that money? Patrick Redfern of course. She was the type of woman easily swindled by a handsome young man, but she was not at all the type of woman to be blackmailed. She was far too transparent, not good enough at keeping a secret. The blackmailer's story had never rung true to my mind. And yet there had been that conversation overheard, ah, but overheard by whom? Patrick Redfern's wife. It was her story, unsupported by any outside evidence. Why was it invented? The answer came to me like lightning. To account for the absence of Arlena's money. Patrick and Christine Redfern. The two of them were in it together. Christine hadn't got the physical strength to strangle her or the mental makeup. No, it was Patrick who had done it, but that was impossible. Every minute of his time was accounted for until the body was found. Body, the word stirred something in my mind, bodies lying on the beach, all alike. Patrick Redfern and Emily Brewster had got to the cove and seen a body lying there. A body, suppose it was not Arlena's body but somebody else's? The face was hidden by the great Chinese hat. But there was only one dead body, Arlena's. Then, could it be, a live body, someone pretending to be dead? Could it be Arlena herself, inspired by Patrick to play some kind of a joke? I shook my head, no, too risky. A live body, whose? Was there any woman who would help Redfern? Of course, his wife. But she was a white-skinned delicate creature. Ah yes, but suntan can be applied out of bottles, bottles, I had one of my jigsaw pieces. Yes, and afterwards, of course, a bath, to wash that telltale stain off before she went out to play tennis. And the scissors? Why, to cut up that duplicate cardboard hat, an unwieldy thing that must be got out of the way, and in the haste the scissors were left behind, the one thing that the pair of murderers forgot. But where was Arlena all the time? That again was perfectly clear. Either Rosamund Darnley or Arlena Marshall had been in the Pixies' cave, the scent they both used told me that. It was certainly not Rosamund Darnley. Then it was Arlena, hiding till the coast should clear. When Emily Brewster went off in the boat, Patrick had the beach to himself and full opportunity to commit the crime. Arlena Marshall was killed after a quarter to twelve, but the medical evidence was only concerned with the earliest possible time the crime could have been committed. That Arlena was dead at a quarter to twelve was what was told to the doctor, not what he told the police. 
two more points had to be settled. Linda Marshall's evidence gave Christine Redfern an alibi. Yes, but that evidence depended on Linda Marshall's wristwatch. All that was needed was to prove that Christine had had two opportunities of tampering with the watch. I found those easily enough. She had been alone in Linda's room that morning, and there was an indirect proof. Linda was heard to say that she was afraid she was going to be late, but when she got down it was only 25 past 10 by the lounge clock. The second opportunity was easy, she could alter the watch back again as soon as Linda turned her back and went down to bathe. Then there was the question of the ladder. Christine had always declared she had no head for heights. Another carefully prepared lie. I had my mosaic now, each piece beautifully fitted into its place. But, unfortunately, I had no definite proof. It was all in my mind. It was then that an idea came to me. There was an assurance, a slickness about the crime. I had no doubt that in the future Patrick Redfern would repeat his crime. What about the past? It was. Remotely possible that this was not his first killing. The method employed, strangulation, was in harmony with his nature, a killer for pleasure as well as for profit. If he was already a murderer I was sure that he would have used the same means. I asked Inspector Colgate for a list of women victims of strangulation. The result filled me with joy. The death of Nellie Parson found strangled in a lonely copse might or might not be Patrick Redfern's work, it might merely have suggested choice of locality to him but in Alice Corgan's death I found exactly what I was looking for. In essence the same method. Juggling with time, a murder committed not, as is the usual way, before it is supposed to have happened, but afterwards. A body supposedly discovered at a quarter past four. A husband with an alibi up to twenty-five past four. What really happened? It was said that Edward Corrigan arrived at the Pine Ridge, found his wife not there, and went out and walked up and down. Actually, of course, he ran full speed to the rendezvous, Caesar's Grove, which you will remember was quite nearby, killed her and returned to the cafe. The girl hiker who reported the crime was a most respectable young lady, games mistress in a well-known girl's school. Apparently she had no connection with Edward Corrigan. She had to walk some way to report the death. The police surgeon only examined the body at a quarter to six. As in this case the time of death was accepted without question. I made one final test. I must know definitely if Mrs. Redfern was a liar. I arranged our little excursion to Dartmoor. If anyone has a bad head for heights, they are never comfortable crossing a narrow bridge over running water. Miss Brewster, a genuine sufferer, showed giddiness. But Christine Redfern, unconcerned, ran across without a qualm. It was a small point, but it was a definite test. If she had told one unnecessary lie, then all the other lies were possible. In the meantime Colgate had got the photograph identified by the Surrey police. I played my hand in the only way I thought likely to succeed. Having lulled Patrick Redfern into security, I turned on him and did my utmost to make him lose his self-control. The knowledge that he had been identified with Corrigan caused him to lose his head completely. Hercule Poirot stroked his throat reminiscently. What I did, he said with importance, was exceedingly dangerous, but I do not regret it. I succeeded. I did not suffer in vain. There was a moment's silence. Then Mrs. Gardner gave a deep sigh. Why, M. Poirot, she said. It's just been too wonderful, hearing just exactly how you got your results. It's every bit as fascinating as a lecture on criminology, in fact it is a lecture on criminology. And to think my magenta wool and that sunbathing conversation actually had something to do with it? That really makes me too excited for words, and I'm sure Mr. Gardner feels the same, don't you, Odell? Yes, darling, said Mr. Gardner. Hercule Poirot said. Mr. Gardner too was of assistance to me. I wanted the opinion of a sensible man about Mrs. Marshall. I asked Mr. Gardner what he thought of her. Is that so, said Mrs. Gardner. 
And what did you say about her, Odell? Mr. Gardner coughed. He said. Well, darling, I never did think very much of her, you know. That's the kind of thing men always say to their wives, said Mrs. Gardner. And if you ask me, even M, Poro here is what I should call a shade on the indulgent side about her, calling her a natural victim and all that. Of course it's true that she wasn't a cultured woman at all, and as Captain Marshall isn't here I don't mind saying that she always did seem to me kind of dumb. I said so to Mr. Gardner, didn't I, Odell? Yes, darling, said Mr. Gardner. Linda Marshall sat with Hercule Poirot on Gull Cove. She said. Of course I'm glad I didn't die after all. But you know, M. Poirot, it's just the same as if I'd killed her, isn't it? I meant to. Hercule Poirot said energetically. It is not at all the same thing. The wish to kill and the action of killing are two different things. If in your bedroom instead of a little wax figure you had had your stepmother bound and helpless and a dagger in your hand instead of a pin, you would not have pushed it into her heart. Something within you would have said no, it is the same with me. I enrage myself at an imbecile. I say, I would like to kick him. Instead, I kick the table. I say, this table, it is the imbecile, I kick him so. And then, if I have not hurt my toe too much, I feel much better and the table it is not usually damaged. But if the imbecile himself was there I should not kick him. To make the wax figures and stick in the pins, it is silly, yes, it is childish, yes, but it does something useful too. You took the hate out of yourself and put it into that little figure. And with the pin and the fire you destroyed, not your stepmother, but the hate you bore her. Afterwards, even before you heard of her death, you felt cleansed, did you not, you felt lighter, happier? Linda nodded. She said. How did you know? That's just how I did feel. Poro said. Then do not repeat to yourself the imbecilities. Just make up your mind not to hate your next stepmother. Linda said startled. Do you think I'm going to have another? Oh, I see. You mean Rosamund. I don't mind her. She hesitated a minute. She's sensible. It was not the adjective that Poirot himself would have selected for Rosamund Darnley, but he realized that it was Linda's idea of high praise. Kenneth Marshall said. Rosamund, did you get some extraordinary idea into your head that I'd killed Arlena? Rosamund looked rather shamefaced. She said. I suppose I was a damned fool. Of course you were. Yes, but Ken, you are such an oyster. I never knew what you really felt about Arlena. I didn't know if you accepted her as she was and were just frightfully decent about her, or whether you, well, just believed in her blindly. And I thought if it was that, and you suddenly found out that she was letting you down you might go mad with rage. I've heard stories about you. You're always very quiet, but you're rather frightening sometimes. So you thought I just took her by the throat and throttled the life out of her? Well, yes, that's just exactly what I did think. And your alibi seemed a bit on the light side. That's when I suddenly decided to take a hand, and made up that silly story about seeing you typing in your room. And when I heard that you said you'd seen me looking, well, that made me quite sure you'd done it. That and Linda's queerness. Kenneth Marshall said with a sigh. Don't you realize that I said I'd seen you in the mirror in order to back up your story? I, I thought you needed it corroborated. Rosamund stared at him. You don't mean you thought that I killed your wife? Kenneth Marshall shifted uneasily. He mumbled. Dash it all, Rosamund, don't you remember how you nearly killed that boy about that dog once? How you hung onto his throat and wouldn't let go. But that was years ago. Yes, I know. Rosamund said sharply. What earthly motive do you think I had to kill Arlena? His glance shifted. He mumbled something again. Rosamund cried. Ken, you massive conceit. You thought I killed her out of altruism on your behalf, did you? 
or, did you think I killed her because I wanted you myself? Not at all, said Kenneth Marshall indignantly. But you know what you said that day, about Linda and everything, and, and you seem to care what happened to me. Rosamund said. I've always cared about that. I believe you have. You know, Rosamund, I can't usually talk about things, I'm not good at talking, but I'd like to get this clear. I didn't care for Arlena, only just a little at first, and living with her day after day was a pretty nerve-wracking business. In fact it was absolute hell, but I was awfully sorry for her. She was such a damned fool, crazy about men, she just couldn't help it, and they always let her down and treated her rottenly. I simply felt I couldn't be the one to give her the final push. I'd married her and it was up to me to look after her as best I could. I think she knew that and was grateful to me really. She was, she was a pathetic sort of creature really. Rosamund said gently. It's alright, Ken. I understand now. Without looking at her Kenneth Marshall carefully filled a pipe. He mum. Bled. You're pretty good at understanding, Rosamund. A faint smile curved Rosamund's ironic mouth. She said. Are you going to ask me to marry you now, Ken, or are you determined to wait six months? Kenneth Marshall's pipe dropped from his lips and crashed on the rocks below. He said. Damn, that's the second pipe I've lost down here. And I haven't got another with me. How the devil did you know I'd fixed six months as the proper time? I suppose because it is the proper time. But I'd rather have something definite now, please. Because in the intervening months you may come across some other persecuted female and rush to the rescue in chivalrous fashion again. He laughed. You're going to be the persecuted female this time, Rosamund. You're going to give up that damn dressmaking business of yours and we're going to live in the country. Don't you know that I make a very handsome income out of my business? Don't you realize that it's my business, that I created it and worked it up, and that I'm proud of it? And you've got the damn nerve to come along and say, give it all up, dear. I've got the damn nerve to say it, yes. And you think I care enough for you to do it? If you don't, said Kenneth Marshall, you'd be no good to me. Rosamund said softly. Oh, my dear. I've wanted to live in the country with you all my life. Now, it's going to come true. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The end. Please, don't forget to like the video if you like it. And subscribe. See you in another story.